Hello, and welcome to this seventh class in our series, The History of the Liturgy. In the first six classes, we explored the various components that make up our Sunday morning worship service. We reviewed uh, their form, their purpose, as well as their history and development through time. However, in addition to the portions of the worship service itself, there are additional elements that add to our Sunday morning worship service and which have their own history and function. Today, in this class, we're going to be exploring many of these physical aspects of our worship service that are used on Sunday mornings and seen in service, beginning with and uh, covering mostly the vestments, the attire worn by the clergy, as well as other leaders in worship on Sunday mornings. So thank you for joining with us in this course on the vestments and other elements in this seventh class in our series today. Through time and across cultures, it is common for different clothing to indicate a person's role, function within society. And the same is true of church clothing. In worship services, various uh, artifacts, articles of clothing are worn to indicate a purpose being performed by individuals in the worship service. Uh, this helps as it immediately identifies individuals in the service uh, who they are and what their function is. And for those who have grown up in a liturgical service, those clothes help uh, facilitate the service because people automatically know what they are. Such clothing usually will highlight the role of the individual and the individual personality will be uh, put into the background while, while the role and, and the, the office that they're filling uh, comes to the fore. Also, the, the clothing that is worn by, by ministers as well as by worship assistants adds beauty to the service. Usually, they're very uh, tastefully and delicately done. Usually, they're of a higher quality of material, and they reflect the beauty, the grace, uh, the, just the, the visual appeal uh, of our faith. It's, it's an expression of that. And also, these uh, pieces of clothing uh, serve to illustrate where the church is in the, in the church's uh, year as a change of clothing uh, highlights, uh, you know, what exactly are the themes being, being paramount, uh, as well as indicating special uh, events that may happen in the worship service, uh, such as communion or baptism or an installation or ordination or something similar to that. And clerical clothing also illustrates the continuity of history of the church, as the clothing worn by ministers is largely unchanged. Uh, from that to the, to the very beginning of the Christian church. And so it uh, illustrates this, this unbroken line of Christian worship that is uh, happening in the present, connecting us back to its very beginnings and to all Christians through history. These pieces of church clothing are known as vestments, coming from a Latin word that means article of everyday clothing. And so these vestments are what are worn by ministers as well as by uh, other assistants in worship, whether ordained or laity, that illustrates their, their role and function within the, the worship service. The most common vestment, and one that is worn by all people serving in worship, whether they're, they're uh, members of the clergy of any order, uh, whether they're lay assistants or even choristers or acolytes, is the alb. The alb is a, is a long white robe. And this comes from uh, this, this alb, which is the most commonly used church article, is also has the oldest continuous history. It, the alb was uh, taken from the, the Latin term tunica alba, meaning uh, white tunic. And in the late Roman Empire, uh, all people or all working men would wear what's called a, a tunic. And this tunic was generally rectangular in shape, uh, usually didn't have sleeves, and just covered the, the torso and the legs uh, down to the thigh, it was generally wrapped around the body and pinned in place. Uh, however, uh, in around 270 AD, the, the emperor decided to add sleeves, which were until then uncustomary, 
in Roman attire. They, they viewed sleeves as well as trousers as uh, being barbarian in style. But in the, the late third century, it was introduced and the, became the norm to have longer sleeves and longer uh, legging or longer covering of the legs also industry illustrated people from the more professional classes as they would not need to have their, you know, their, their legs or their arms unencumbered for manual labor. And so the all that we see in, wor- in church worship today is nearly identical in shape and design to that which was worn by uh, Roman men of the upper classes uh, in the late Roman Empire. The Rome fell for the first time in 410 AD and was uh, conquered uh, consecutively by several other, uh, you know, barbarian tribes in the fifth century. And into the early Middle Ages, the apparel of uh, those members of the former Roman Empire, as well as across Europe, began to change and develop in different directions. However, the Christian church, as its clergy had been wearing this same tunic, which was customary to, for all uh, you know, Roman adult men, uh, this began to be, uh, well, well, the vernacular clothing or the, the everyday customary clothing of the people changed. This standard clothing of the clergy uh, was retained and it was continued in use uh, in the church through the Middle Ages, as well as uh, up until today by many liturgical churches. This uh, white garment originally was white because that's what everybody wore. It was just a a white tunic. It was uh, everyday clothing. Uh, But it has come to to symbolize in its whiteness uh, the joy, the, the life found in Christ. Uh, it's usually used with a, a cincture, often known as a girdle, which is a, a rope that holds it in place. And for pastors and deacons and bishops, those ordained clergy members, this is often accompanied by a stole, which is a, a cloth colored band that usually runs around the neck and is draped down to the floor. And this uh, indicates one's ordained role within the church. It has a, a varied history. Uh, some historians regard it as uh, deriving from the orarium, which was uh, something similar that was worn around the neck by of officials within the Roman Empire to illustrate their rank or their position. Uh, others regard it as more of a, a basically a, a towel. Many people of the time would have a, a towel either over their left shoulder or around their neck. And we can imagine in a time before uh, you know, plumbing, indoor plumbing, even though the Romans did have a fairly uh, extremely advanced plumbing system, uh, it was certainly not for, for all peoples. Having a towel handy would be very helpful for cleaning for all sorts of, of in- instances. The, uh, the, the stole, what was worn, would be used to clean the, the chalice or the plates for communion as well as just for wiping one's hands or for uh, wiping one's brow if perspiring. And so it served a very practical function, uh, but it's it since come to be largely symbolic. And it, it, it indicates today the yoke that ordained ministers take upon themselves in following Christ and fulfilling this specific function. While an alb and stole is typically used during communion services, there are other garments that can regularly be worn by clergy. The most common is the cassock. A cassock is technically an undergarment, and it's black. Uh, it's, a, it's a long garment fitted to the waist and thereafter uh, fitted freely. And typically has 33 clasps or buttons, which indicate the number of years in Jesus' life. This is uh, worn for everyday business. It's a, it's a piece of general apparel, still worn frequently by those of the Eastern Orthodox faith and occasionally by those from more liturgical Western traditions. In worship services, this is often covered over by what's known as a surplice, which resembles the alb in many ways. It's not quite as long, it uh, doesn't fold, it's, it's simply uh, put over one's head, but it likewise is a, is a white garment that basically gives a, a nice liturgical presentation and is used for many lesser worship functions, such as worshiping at the, the hours of the day, 
uh, or other other minor services where communion is not performed or, or any other sacraments are, are observed or anything out of the ordinary. Another frequently seen liturgical item is known as the chasuble. This is a, a heavy, large, poncho-like covering. Like the surplus, it basically goes over one's head. And this is a, a usually a highly decorative item that is worn by a presiding minister when uh, celebrating communion. This uh, is worn by priests or bishops or pastors that indicates their, uh, their role in the office of celebrating communion. And it can often be very, very elaborately embellished and historically, often with uh, very, very rich designs, sometimes including gold and jewels, again, indicating the richness, the, uh, the opulence of a life of faith in Christ. A couple other commonly used uh, items by assisting ministers is known as the tunical and the dalmatic. These are two items, the tunical worn by a what's known as a subdeacon or a sub-assistant or a junior assistant, a uh, dalmatic worn by uh, a deacon or an assistant, and they, like the chasuble, are worn over an alb when communion is being celebrated. The dalmatic is a little bit more ornate, uh, the tunical a little bit less so, but they usually pair together with the chasuble to present a complete set of design for celebrating at communion. A few other interesting pieces of vestments that are worn by bishops or those who are of a, of a higher rank than pastors or priests is uh, often a cope. This is a, a cloak that uh, is usually also of heavier fabric, which is clasped at the neck. And this uh, cloak is usually of the color of the season and is especially used for more important functions such as ordinations, confirmations, installations, weddings, baptism, and the like. It can also be used by regular clergy for uh, ceremonies, uh, for processionals on these special occasions, but is, is very frequently used by bishops. Bishops uh, also sometimes use a mitre, which is a cross between a crown and uh, a hat, uh, can sometimes be, be ornamented uh, very elaborately, and is uh, perhaps most conspicuous in its form as, as a double-pointed hat, which is uh, worn by some ministers of high liturgical churches. Uh, a bishop may also wear or use a crozier, which is a, a shepherd's staff to indicate their office as a as a, you know a pastor's pastor, and they may also wear a large pectoral cross. A pectoral cross is is a cross worn on the chest, and it's usually identified by just being a really big cross. If you ever see a large cross and you think to yourself, "Wow, that's a really big cross," it's usually a pectoral cross and a one that is reserved for the office of bishop. Uh, just as a stole is given to a pastor or priest at the ordination, so is a pectoral cross given to a bishop at the time of their ordination. Other additional items of clothing have been worn by clergy for millennia to indicate their role within the worship service, uh, down to footwear, gloves, rings, scarfs known as amices, uh, other pieces also ornament or elaborate, indicate a minister's role, both in worship, but also just general in the life of the church. And it must be said that tracing the history of these articles of clothing is a little bit more difficult than examining the histories of the components of the worship service, which we've explored to this point. In the former instance, the liturgical components we've studied have all been literary in character. They have been written down, and they are not only described in, in ample secondary writings, but we have the texts themselves to study in detail. Clothing, however, deteriorates uh, much more easily and are less frequently preserved than books. For this reason, we don't have nearly the same quantity of ancient fabrics as we do uh, ancient books, which were often preserved and recorded and copied 
and stored in libraries. We do have some instances, and furthermore, we have uh, paintings, frescoes, we have stained glass windows, uh, carvings in marble, in, uh, in bronze, and uh, also, you know, secondhand descriptions of these items. However, uh, it must be said that our, understand, our detailed understanding is not as comprehensive as it is for the, the literary elements of a worship service and is open in some cases to a fair bit of conjecture. Uh, there's been a, a couple developments within the last five centuries within clerical uh, attire or vestments that are worth mentioning. Uh, firstly, in the Reformed tradition, uh, there developed the practice of doing away with ornaments in church, with icons, sometimes with music, and also with clerical vestments. Uh, for this reason, many clergy in some Reformed churches discontinued the wearing of the traditional Christian vestments and wore instead uh, their everyday clothing to preside at worship services. Uh, and this resembled the very early church which, in which his clergy did not wear special clothing, but just the everyday clothing, although usually finer clothing, you know, having clean clothes was indicated in the, in the early centuries of the church, you know, and being properly prepared in one's outfit for, for worship of God. Um, but uh, these, these reformed churches, especially in Switzerland, uh, reverted to wearing just their everyday clothing. For many pastors, this was uh, academic garb, as many of them were also professors, academics, writers, and so forth. And so their preaching and presiding wear would often be uh, academic gowns. The Geneva gown developed out of this uh, from Geneva in Switzerland. And uh, therefore, in some Reformed traditions and coming into some Baptist traditions today, the outfit of clergy in worship more resembles a full academic gown, often black and sometimes uh, with academic accents. And this history comes through, through this uh, movement within the Reformation. Also, the, the trend within the last 30, 40 years uh, in the United States and the West and also around the world in places of wearing everyday clothing, whether suits or even jeans and, and T-shirts in some cases, a, a reversion to wearing everyday clothes in worship, again, emulating the practice of the first church, uh, just as Jesus might have worn his everyday, the everyday clothes of the people or the apostles um, or the, as the church did for the first few centuries. Uh, basically, wearing the clothing, everyday clothing, the clothing of the people, uh, not distinguishing the clergy from the people has been uh, a development within, uh, you know, within the last several years, within the last several decades, one could say, in the Western Christian church. And lastly, the clerical collar, which I'm sporting presently, is uh, largely a product of the 19th century. Uh, black has often been a, a color of uh, professionals, you know, whether for suits, uh, for judges, uh, for uh, other professional roles. Uh, black is a very customary color, and it too was worn by clergy for, you know, for many centuries, for everyday, for everyday clothing. Uh, this clerical color also known as the Roman color, or sometimes referred to as the dog color, uh, was developed in the, the mid and latter part of the 19th century and became generally standard wear for ministers, uh, particularly in the more liturgical traditions. Uh, it's since uh, been paired with a suit since the middle of the 20th century uh, and is uh, not uniformly worn, but is, is variously worn by, by ministers uh, very much so in the Catholic Church. In, uh, it is represented in the Anglican Church, in some Lutheran, Methodist, and Presbyterian churches as well, uh, just to indicate in everyday wear and also sometimes under uh, other worship vestments representing a, a minister's role. However, clothing isn't the only item that adds to worship services on Sunday mornings. 
Fabrics are also used to decorate the sanctuary itself, uh, imbuing it with beauty, with cleanliness, uh, as well as reflecting the season or the special day in which the worship service falls. These are known as pyramids. Pyramids are uh, specially designed liturgical uh, pieces of fabric to ornament the sanctuary for worship. The most common ones are those decorating the altar. The altar has on it uh, two pieces, one known as linens, which are always white, again representative of the alb, uh, white, clean, uh, nicely pressed and cared for linens that cover the altar. And hanging down in front of the altar is a piece known as a frontal, uh, sometimes also included as a, as a super frontal, a secondary uh, portion that, that hangs down to cover a bit of the frontal. And these are usually within the color of the season. Also decorating the sanctuary are often pulpit scarves or lectern cloths, uh, pieces of fabric that drape down from, from either position to likewise represent the color of the season. Now we should take a quick detour at this point to remember the calendar. If we recall back to very early in this, in this course, we explored the church calendar and the colors represented uh, within the clerical vestments, uh, within a stole or chasuble or cope or dogmatic or tunical, or in these frontals and pulpit scarves and, and lector cloths. These all change with the season to indicate what season is in. Uh, in the season of Advent, the color is usually purple or royal blue indicating the advent of royalty. Uh, it is also a penitential season, and purple is often worn during Lent as well to indicate this, uh, this time of penitence and repentance. The, uh, the gold of Christmas is, uh, is indicated of, of kingship and glory and wonder and awe. The uh, season of Epiphany is, and that of the season after Pentecost is green indicating growth. Uh, there are some special colors. Red is used occasionally for Pentecost, uh, for Reformation Sunday, and red indicates the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. It also indicates the blood of the martyrs or of uh, the blood of Christ at times. And these colors change with the season to indicate the essential meaning of the season being worshiped in. But clothing and fabrics aren't the only things that decorate a sanctuary. One other common item to be found in sanctuaries are crosses. The cross is the central symbol of the Christian faith, uh, bringing to mind immediately the crucifixion of Christ for our salvation. Also, interestingly, the cross is uh, two lines, uh, one vertical, one horizontal, the vertical uh, symbolically representing the, the connection between God and, and mankind, and the second vertically uh, connecting humanity to one another, uh, which is the, the bringing together of both in the Christian faith. There is, in many churches, a large cross uh, either hanging from the ceiling or behind the altar. Uh, it uh, will often have central place in many churches. And also there's oftentimes what's known as a processional cross a cross on a wooden staff that is carried into the sanctuary at the beginning of service to indicate the beginning and uh, part of a, a larger processional of oftentimes uh, uh, candles or the gospel book or clergy members to indicate the beginning of the worship service. Other items commonly found within sanctuaries are candles. Candles originally served a utilitarian function of providing light indoors before electricity was developed. At this point, they serve uh, largely a symbolic function, representing Christ as the light of the world. Typically, an altar will have two altar candles or two altar candelabra, which uh, derive from ancient Jewish practice uh, uh, for the Sabbath, one indicating observance of the Sabbath and another indicating remembrance of the Sabbath. Sometimes these two candles also symbolically represent the humanity and the divinity of Christ. 
Many churches have a sanctuary lamp, a uh, something hanging oftentimes from the ceiling or fixed to the wall, a lamp that is lit always and doesn't go out. This also was an ancient Jewish practice of the temple, and it indicates uh, God's eternal presence within the sanctuary and also uh, indicating God is a light that will never be extinguished, but is, is always alive, always, always living and vibrant. And a third uh, frequent candle is known as the Paschal candle or the Easter candle. Now, this candle is uh, often very tall, usually at least 30 inches, and is also often on a stand that's at least four feet tall. So altogether, it can be you know, upwards of seven feet tall. And they can get very large. Uh, historically, some of them have been uh, 300 pounds or more and on stands that were more than 10 feet tall. And these are lit for, uh, especially for Easter, designating the resurrection of Christ. It is typically lit on the, the Easter vigil and lit again through the Easter season uh, and only at the time to emphasize the resurrection of Christ from the dead, that the light has come back into the world. This is also used in baptisms. It is lit again at the, when we are baptized and we are brought to new life and baptismal candles are lit from this Paschal candle. And it's also often used at funerals to indicate again this connection of Christ's resurrection, our death and resurrection and new life in baptism, and our own resurrection, uh, which takes place after our death. And so this Paschal candle has this particular significance to uh, resurrecting to life in the Christian faith. Also often found in worship services, in addition to sounds and sights, are smells. This takes the form of incense. Incense has been practiced in, in worship since ancient times, uh, also indicated in the Jewish temple, and is often used in more liturgical churches, particularly in the Eastern Orthodox churches, for uh, communion services, for vespers, as well as for other special services. This uh, incense is lit in what's known as a censer or a thurible, and this either hangs from a chain uh, somewhere in the sanctuary or is held and swung by either a priest or a deacon uh, preparing for the worship service. It has the, the beautiful advantage of, of adding a rich smell to the worship service. Uh, it also adds some, a little bit of smoke to the sanctuary, which can heighten the, the ambiance. But it has fallen a little bit out of favor in recent years in liturgical churches as it's uh, uh, not altogether comfortable for everybody. You know, some people do have sensitivities or allergies, and uh, for this reason, it's not as frequently used as it was in previous times. Uh, the incense most often used is frankincense. Uh, sometimes myrrh is also, also used, reminiscent of the gifts that were brought to Christ on his birth by the wise men. And uh, incense is likewise not uncommonly used in private devotions as well uh, with one's uh, reading of the offices or in dev devotional prayer. Just as uh, everyday Christians may light a candle to accompany their prayers, so to the lighting of incense is not uncustomary whatsoever to uh, further uh, accentuate this time of, of devotion to God. When attending worship, one may notice other elements as well that fill the sanctuary. There are special implements for celebrating baptisms, uh, such as oil, uh, baptismal candles, and, and cloths. For the celebration of communion, there is uh, a chalice or chalices. There are, are caboriums and uh, special fabrics that also accompany this. There are, there are altar books or missiles and stands to hold the books and uh, a variety of other uh, implements that are found in the worship, that are found to enhance and facilitate the worship service. These all have their own particular histories, and I may suggest, uh, you know, exploring them if of interest in more detail in more specialized books. But uh, each of these has its own long history of the Christian tradition, and uh, it's still generally in use and of use to facilitate worship service on Sunday mornings. And this concludes our survey of 
the most prominent church vestments, the basic church pyramids, and also a, a cursory exploration of other implements that are used in the worship service. And in our next and final class of the series, we will be turning our attention to the buildings within worship takes place themselves, the uh, church architecture that also not only holds, but symbolically represents the Christian faith. At the same time, we'll be exploring some common symbols found uh, in sanctuaries and also uh, on everyday Christians and uh, exploring what they mean and how they've come to us today. So thank you for joining us in this class and look forward to seeing you again next time for our final series, That on Church Architecture. God bless you this week.